That's right. Uh, I'll try. I'll try to keep it as simple as possible and as quick as possible because uh, we're going to see uh, practical results. So not only not only fundamental results, but also practical results and uh, research uh, from three different experiments. So uh, yeah, it can get messy. I'm gonna try to make it as simple as possible and try to explain the methods in each, in each experiment. So uh, we kind of can link. Uh, the method to the result to the conclusion. Um, okay, so let me first um, focus on um, saying or splitting the positions or the, uh, the, the performance of this skill, which it can be performed in a set play, like penalty, free kick, and uh, like these kind of plays, and it can be also performed in open plays. Now, usually in biomechanics, if we want to understand a complex skill, because it's a skill also performed, it's an open skill, it's not a closed skill. And in order to understand it, we need to, we need to isolate it. And uh, my, my, my research was the, the first kind of research uh, in aiming to understand this. And, uh, we really wanted to isolate it and then to start moving one step at a time uh, and the eventually and the ultimately reach the point where we understand also what's happening in open place and how we can optimize the performance in open place. So um, let's start. So I'm, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be presenting and explaining the results of these three uh, published research and we're going to start with the first one uh, before starting the the common the common experimental setup of the three research is that in the three research we used an opto electronic system and this opto electronic system are basically infrared cameras and 10 of them uh, and basically they can detect the position of these uh, uh, bright markers that we are seeing on the body of the golden keepers. Uh, yeah, and then we can reconstruct the model, which we will see in the next slide. And we also used uh, two force platforms, one in under each leg to capture the forces of each, of, of each leg and be able to differentiate bet between them and the contribution to the performance. And we also used two high-speed cameras to try to uh, overlay the 3D model on the real footage and try to understand further the movement. Now, this is the shared experimental setup between the three studies. So this is always there. Now, what is specific for the first uh, study? We had 10 elite goal keepers. Um, and the goalkeepers were performing their preferred te technique. We didn't, we didn't intervene with their technique. We didn't impose any, any kind of changes. Uh, and uh, they had hanging balls in front of the goal in order to simulate more a realistic dive. So not pure lateral movement, but it was one, one meter in front of the goal. And we had also two heights, so high balls, 190 centimeters from the mattress and low balls uh, at 30 centimeters centimeter at both sides. So basically the goalkeeper cannot predict and cannot anticipate the height or the side of the goal. We had the light board in front of the, and you can see it, basically here. So that was the light board. And basically this light board was at the, the penalty spot. And uh, in a light will turn on, uh, indicating the height and side of the ball that should be saved. So we had four lights, right high, right low, left high, left low. So uh, basically, uh, before starting any, any measurement, we, we kind of reconstruct this uh, uh, 3D, uh, 3D model that from, from there we can, uh, we can actually calculate a bunch of stuff and understand what is actually happening with precision and not only in analyzing uh, uh, footage like uh, high speed cameras and stuff like this, because that's that's also a bit advanced when we want to understand the movement. So 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 we so we want to take it back to a really precise measurement, and then we kind of um, move one step at a time. So and then and then that's that's what what, what we are seeing here is a goalkeeper uh, in the study. 
is one trial performing a preferred save to the left high ball. And of course, the ball was uh, attached to the string with a magnet. So the, goal, the goalkeeper was, was, was free to uh, hit the ball or catch the ball. Like uh, we, didn't, we didn't also intervene with how they are saving the ball. So we uh, just let them do it. Um, and, and, and we are seeing also the uh, slow motion video from the high speed camera and we're seeing also the 3D, 3D model. So what did, what did we found? We found that the goalkeeper, they preferred to start with a stance with at 33%. So of course we, we asked the goalkeeper, the light will turn on. And once the light will turn on, just dive as fast as possible. We wanted to see this quick, quick uh, movement and how they will set themselves. So a 33% to 40% uh, stance width, and we also normalize this to leg length to be able to compare it across uh, subject. So it was actually around 33% leg length. Knee flexion angle was around 62 degrees, and hip flexion angle was similar, around 63 degrees. So that was the optimal uh, preferred starting 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 position across the subject. And basically, the variation between them was very low, like indicating that. That was the preferred, but at the same time, the optimal. And we didn't have only subjects, uh, so on only goalkeepers from Ajax. In this, in this study, we had goalkeepers also from outside of Ajax. And actually, one goalkeeper was coming from Barcelona back, 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 back then, from the first team of Barcelona, which is, which is now the first, the first goal, like, the goal uh, keeper at, at Ajax, Andre, Andre Onana. And also, uh, we, had, we, had, we had also uh, goalkeepers from other clubs uh, from, from the first division in uh, Holland as, as well. So we didn't have only goalkeepers following the same training methodology, which was, uh, which was nice to see that they, they, they all met in this, in this preferred, preferred kind of uh, movement. So let's, uh, let's see. What, um, what we can further analyze with this that we cannot analyze with high-speed camera and with footage. We, we actually calculated the center of mass of the body and we projected it. And from, from there, uh, we calculated the linear, the linear momentum, uh, the horizontal and the vertical and the angular and the angular momentum. And what did we see? So what, what we are seeing in red is the horizontal momentum. Uh, we're seeing uh, the solid line is for high dive and dashed line is for low dive. And the blue line is for vertical momentum, the same thing, solid line, high dive, and dashed line is for low dive. And we're seeing clearly that the horizontal momentum was more crucial in the dive. So the goalkeepers needed to develop this uh, high horizontal momentum. And this, is, this was the first um, kind of... Uh, <laughs> not clash, I don't want to say clash in the ideas. Let's, let's put it like this, clash in the ideas between us, the, the researcher, and between the coaching, the coaching team, like that they were focusing more on vertical jump in their training. Whereas what we see here, the goalkeeper didn't need to jump vertically much, didn't need to generate this vertical, the vertical momentum. And uh, that was quite logical when, for, when, when, see, when, when seeing that, 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 that they had to cover more horizontal distance than, than, vertical, than vertical distance in the dive. So this was the first, the first result that we saw, that horizontal momentum was more important and more crucial in the dive than vertical one. The second one was the angle, the angle momentum, which was, of course, which was evident in both heights. So in, in high dive, which, which, are we, which we are seeing in red and low dive in blue. So it was evident in, in both dive, but it was more crucial in low dive, which was also um, uh, in a very logical here. And we didn't, we didn't, um, we didn't have a contradictory uh, um, in ideas about it with the coaching team, because of course they have to fall so they have to turn their, their, their body as quick as possible um, to, to low dives than, than to high dives. Now, what's important from this first study? So we kind of analyzed the, the velocity of the center of mass towards the ball and kind of looked at the contralateral push-off, so the leg opposite to the movement that, that the goalkeeper is diving towards, and the epsilateral push-off. And of course, 
we could do this because we had the force space. So we, we, we could see how much forces are being generated by the legs, by, by, by each leg se separately. And we had the kinematics. So we had the movement and we could see, okay, how much contribution from these uh, forces are being put uh, to, to the center of mass velocity, which, which basically reflect the whole, the whole body movement. And we're talking about the velocity toward the, the ball, of course. So what did we see? This first graph is the contribution to the vertical velocity, because of course we split our, we, we split the velocity into a vertical velocity and the horizontal velocity. And we wanted to see how much contribution from each leg to the vertical one and to the horizontal one. So to the vertical one, uh, in this graph, we're seeing contralateral leg in blue, ipsilateral leg in red. I would like to remind you, contralateral leg is the leg opposite to the side of the dive. Ipsilateral leg is the leg the same side of the dive. So in the diving safe, the contralateral leg will leave the ground first, and then the ipsilateral leg is the last leg that will push off, basically, and will leave the ground. So we're seeing clearly that, that that's, that's the zero line here. We're seeing clearly that the contralateral leg, which is in blue, is contributing, especially at the first. So what we're seeing, this first vertical line, this is the contralateral peak force. The contralateral leg is performing the highest force at this point. And this is the peak force of the ipsilateral leg. So from the start of the dive, we're seeing that the contralateral leg is contributing way more than the ipsilateral leg. Why? Because the ipsilateral leg is busy just positioning, uh, the goalkeeper is busy positioning the ipsilateral leg in the perfect, in the perfect position for the next push off. So, and basically the, the only contribution is, is coming from the contralateral leg. And this, this contribution uh, lasted further in the dive. So lasted longer and it was always greater than the contralateral leg. So that's for the vertical one. What, what about the horizontal one? The horizontal one, we saw also a clear significant difference as well, as, as well between the contribution of the contralateral leg, which is still in blue, and the ipsilateral leg, which is still in red. And especially this, this difference was very pronounced at the beginning. So, so at, the, at the start of this development of uh, force, of this development of power. So what, what, what we can say to the coaches from, from, from this? Well, we can say to the coaches, OK, focus on the contralateral leg. And the coaches would say, yeah, but the ipsilateral leg is the last one that's leaving the ground. How, how we should focus more on the contralateral leg? And of course, in the next part of our discussion, we will deal with this most, more, most probably and most specifically. So yeah, so focus on the contralateral leg. It's more important than the ipsilateral leg in pushing off and developing this horizontal linear momentum and developing this vertical linear, this vertical linear momentum. At the same time, try to quit and reduce these uh, vertical jumps in your training, whether for strength and conditioning or for technical coaches and focus on horizontal uh, uh, jumps and, hori and horizontal push-offs instead of vertical ones. So let's move now to the second study. In the second study, we had nine elite goalkeepers also performing their preferred technique. But what was significantly different than the, the first study that we had ball cannon here. So we, we didn't have balls hanging. Uh, so we tried more, okay, let's see if we can, what, what if we can see the same with, with having ball uh, cannon and let's see uh, a more realistic setup where the ball is coming from the, from, from the front. And we also have, we calibrated the ball cannon to shoot balls uh, right and left at 190, 30 centimeters, of course, plus or minus 10 centimeters off, off and on. And uh, yeah, and also we calibrated the speed of the, uh, the ball cannon to the speed that we saw in the first study, which is around 1.2 seconds. So we wanted the ball to reach the, the ball with around this point because we don't even, we didn't want the goalkeeper to anticipate because he couldn't anticipate. We wanted the, the goalkeeper to react, to have time to react, and then to dive as quick as possible. So here, what was uh, special, we dig deeper into the kinetics. When we talk to kinetics, it's like the reasons 
of these movements. So we're talking here about uh, joint powers, joint moments, and uh, joint angular velocity of the hip, knee, and ankle joints, which are the most, the most important in the push-off. So we calculated these three variables, joint angular velocity, joint moment, and joint, uh, and joint power. And when, when, when we say joint moment is that the forces that, being, that, that are being generated by, by, by the muscles and transferred to the joints. What did we see? I'll try to simplify this, 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 this graph. I wanted to summarize it in one graph, but I will try to simplify it and let you focus on the most important thing. What, what, what we're seeing on the, in, the, in the first line, the first uh, line is the joint, pow joint power, second one, joint moment, third one, joint angular, joint angular velocity. In the first column, we're seeing the hip flexion extension. So the hip joint in the flexion extension. Uh, in the second column, the hip joint in the abduction abduction, so in the frontal plane. In the third column, uh, we're seeing the knee joint in the flexion extension. And uh, last, the, the, the last column, we're seeing the ankle joint and the plantar, uh, plantar dorsiflexion, so in the sagittal plane. So what did we see? If, if, if you notice, of, of course, the hip, hip joint, we notice directly that the hip joint uh, is creating uh, so, so it, like a big, large moment is being generated around the hip joint, especially in the extension, because the extension is the positive, the positive direction. The blue line is always contralateral leg. The red line is always the ipsilateral leg. So we're seeing this clearly in the hip joint. And we're seeing also this clearly in the uh, anchor, plantar, anchor plantar flexion. We're seeing this in the knee extension, but not as pronounced uh, in terms of value, in terms of magnitude, as the hip extension and the anchor plantar, the plantar flexion. So we have some, some uh, imbalance in the distribution and we have a preference so we have like one movement is being uh is is turning to be more important than the other in this triple extension movement whereas also in the hip abduction abduction where we thought okay we we would find there very interesting uh results well we didn't compared compared to the other because we thought that the the movement is mostly in the frontal plane so, uh, so, and we, th we thought that we would see lots of forces being generated in this plane, but we didn't, which was, which, which was, very, which was very interesting and uh, to, to, to our future, to our future results and conclusions. Uh, and in terms of joint power, the highest power was from the hip extension and at the same time from the ankle, from the ankle plantar flexion. So uh, that's, that's what I want to focus at this, this graph this graph, this graph, and this graph. And that's in terms of magnitude. That, that's in terms of values. Now, in terms of coordination, which one started before, before the other? How, how was the coordination? Well, we, thought, we saw a proximal to distal sequence between the hips. So the hip started first, then, then the knee, and then the ankle in both legs, in the contralateral and then the ipsilateral. The contralateral uh, finished, and then the ipsilateral started in terms of peak. So the contralateral hip started, uh, reached the peak first, peak power, of course, that's what, that's what we're talking about. And then the knee, and then the ankle, and then the ipsilateral hip, knee, and then ankle. This was similar to what we see in Olympic weightlifting movement, in vertical jumps, in uh, high jump and long jump in track and field. So this was similar in terms of the, this triple, ex, uh, triple extension, but what was special, because, the, because the, goalkeeper, uh, the goalkeeper movement in terms of dive is special in terms of sequential push-offs. Right? So, so the, the goalkeeper movement is not simultaneous push-off. It's pushing off with one leg and then the other leg. Uh, we, saw, we saw actually the same pattern, proximal to distal, hip, to knee, to, to ankle in uh, both legs. So what we can say to the coaches from these results? Well, um, we can say that hip extension and ankle plantar flexion are the most, the most important movements to focus at in the gym and on the field, especially in the gym. And uh, maybe the hip extension is more important because it's starting the movement. This is what is starting the movement. And we saw this in the coordination. 
and uh, we said also to train the goalkeepers in power exercises where they have to generate this triple extension, hip extension, knee extension, plantar ankle, ankle plantar flexion sequ sequ sequentially, which is similar to the weightlifting exercises. And at the same time, focusing on the hip drive and involving this transfer, because the hip drive is the one that is starting the movement, involving this transfer uh, in the energy to the lower joints, knee and ankle, and leading to this uh, upper body reaching uh, movement that the goalkeeper should 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 always so the energy should um, should uh, be transferred in this in this manner. Now let's conclude with this, with the third study. And the third study, what was interesting is that okay, after looking at the preferred te technique of the goal of, of the goalkeeper, now let's try, try let's try to change some things. In the starting position, where we see, okay, this was interesting to, to, to change from a bio, 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 biomechanical perspective. So seeing, okay, from a physical perspective, using the physics and applying the, the, laws, the, the, the laws of physics, okay, we can say this is better. So let's, let's try if practically is, is also better. So we change stance width. Uh, we, uh, we imposed three different stance width, 50% uh, of leg length, 75% and 100%. And we also imposed three different angles, 45, 75 and 90 de degree knee, knee angle at the starting position. So what did we see? Interestingly, so of course, let me let me uh, uh, start by explaining the PT1 and PT2, these, these abbreviations. So PT1 is preferred technique before imposing any changes. And then we impose the changes, which are stance with 75, 75%, SW100 is 100%, and SW50 is 50%. And then also the, the, the knee angle, 45 degrees, 75 degrees, and 90 degrees. And then after imposing the changes, we have in order to, to to normalize our results and be able to have concrete results, we did again the preferred technique, which is PT2. So we did preferred technique before imposing changes and after imposing changes. What did we see? Clearly, stance with 75 was the fastest in terms of dive time. So goal, goal, goalkeepers dived in terms of movement. Of course, I'm not talking about I'm not talking in terms of reaction time. I'm talking purely movement. We developed an algorithm to be able to split reaction time from movement time. And we're focusing just on movement time. We're focusing just on motor performance. And in terms of movement time, goalkeepers were uh, reach the ball faster when starting from stance width of 75% than when starting of their preferred stance width that was around 40, 35 to 40%. So this was the kind of very, very interesting. And this was the, 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 the goal of every researcher in any field to find something that to falsify all the training practices and try to bring something new to the table. So, okay, then we, we said, we need to know why before, be, before telling the coaches, because the coaches won't, and won't, and won't believe us. So we need to know why, we need to understand why. And then we tell the coaches, this was faster and this is why. So we analyzed the displacement of the center of mass and the velocity of the center of mass towards, towards the ball. Of course, from the start until uh, the uh, fastest reach. What, what we saw, we're seeing clearly. So we, we are comparing PT1, PT2, and stands with 75. We, we don't care about the rest because the, the rest wasn't faster than uh, preferred te technique. So we are focusing on preferred technique and stance with 75 now only to, to, to highlight the changes. The green, the uh, green lines are for stance with 75, red lines are for um, uh, preferred technique, the second one, and blue are for the first preferred technique. We're seeing clearly that at the contralateral push-off, this, this, this was the contralateral push-off, the moment where the contralateral leg is performing this high forces. The velocity of the center of mass in the stance with 75 started to shift from, from the rest. They all started equal. And then at this moment, 
it started to shift. So clearly, at the contralateral push-off, at this moment, the goalkeeper is able to move his center of mass quicker than the usual preferred preferred technique. And this difference was sustained almost until 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 the end. So this was the main the main um, difference between Sanchez 75 and their preferred technique. And then we also wanted to explain this, and we kind of explained it. This is what we are seeing. This is the stance width of the goalkeeper. Preferred technique is red for preferred technique one, blue for preferred technique two. Green is for stance width 75, and we're seeing the extreme stance width 100. So I want you to focus on the green, blue, and red. Whatever is the starting position, the goalkeeper, we saw that the goalkeeper had to increase their stance width, and this is what Matt highlighted clearly in the, in the videos, that the goalkeeper did this double tap, basically to increase their stance width, not to decrease. They never decreased their stance width, uh, unla unless it was for low dives, because they needed to fall and not to push off. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this later. So the goalkeeper always needed to reach this around 90% stance width, even if he started from his preferred stance width. So why, why losing time? and increasing stance width, whereas he can start from a nearby stance width and don't lose time and have more time to basically, and this was the, the, the time that he had more to generate forces. And this was what we saw earlier, more forces in the contralateral push-up because he had more time to generate these, these forces. Of course, the forces, uh, the forces are generated before the movement. We, we saw in the previous figure that the, the velocity increased here because usually in physics, the forces uh, are done before what you see. So what, what, what we see is the velocity and the, and the movement. So what, what we can say to the coaches from, from this? We can say that focus on 75% stance width, of course, uh, normalized to the leg length in the gym and also on the field in both. So when you, when you are asking the goalkeeper to do this pre-jump to uh, prepare for, for the dive, let them focus on this 75% and implement it in strength and conditioning sessions as well as technical sessions. And of course, we followed up uh, these three experiments after understanding the movement better, we followed up these experiments with an intervention study that I'm currently almost done with the data analysis. And I can say that they are promising and hopefully you will see, you will see it soon and um, it's gonna be revealed soon. Uh, where we kind of created the optimal training protocol, strength and conditioning and technical, so in the gym and on the field. Um, and we implemented it for three months. Uh, uh, and we did pre-test and post-test. And we, we, can't, we, can't, we are analyzing the changes in the motor performance, which is purely the dive time. And uh, yeah, and uh, hopefully soon you're gonna, you're gonna be seeing the, the results. So these are, these are the pickup points, um, the take home messages uh, from, from the three studies. And thank you for your interest.